So America provides a particularly interesting case study because we are in in many ways perceived by a lot of people as the the quintessential modern nation. It's a very young country in a lot of ways, and it's it's geared towards modernity. It's 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 about being modern, and um, and yet America insists on cosplaying as Rome. I mean, you go to D.C. and you see all of these federal buildings shaped like Roman temples. You you hear that we have a Senate with senators. Um, our our you know constitution was was written and defended by people who took on Roman names as they wrote the Federalist Papers. It's really quite bizarre and strange and and very wonderful at the same time. But. The whole idea of modernity being kind of a reappropriation of the classical past and reconstructing the future struck me as deeply interesting. So if our modernity is a kind of Greco-Roman punk, what other kinds of punkish modernities can we construct if we use other cultural traditions? What is up, everybody? You are listening to episode 85 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewie to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? Hello, hello. I am doing lovely. How are you? Doing fantastic. Thanks for being here with me. I appreciate it. And I appreciate (laughs) everyone going and supporting MJ's work if you want to go buy Among Thieves, her debut novel. And Thick as Thieves, the sequel, complete duology, full of heists and hatchets and whores and raving good time and lots of good action. And it's a fantastic ride, and I think you will love it. So go give MJ a bit of support there as well. My book, my debut novel, Mushroom Blues. By the time everyone's listening to this episode, there's going to be a cover reveal on January 17th. So take a look at my social media to keep updated on that. Uh, And welcome to 2024. It's a new year. As well, Woo-hoo! a quick note for listeners, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live. So check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app. And subscribe to the FanFatic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now, welcoming today's guest, Ken Liu, award-winning author of the Dandelion Dynasty series, starting with Grace of Kings, the Paper Menagerie short story collection, and more. Thanks so much for joining us, Ken. How are you? Thank you. Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here with you, MJ and Adrian. Yeah, thank you. Very, very happy that we finally get the chance to do this. We met at TBRCon, but um, yeah, I'm glad we get to have a little little sit down and get to know each other better. Yeah, should be a lot of fun. Yeah, man. All right, well, to get started, in case some of our listeners aren't familiar with you and your work, can you introduce yourself and your books? Sure. Uh, I am uh, Ken Liu, as mentioned, um, and I primarily write the very short and the very long. Uh, I write a lot of short (laughs) stories, which is why I have two short story collections, The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories, and The Hidden Girl and Other Stories. And I also have over 150 short stories uh, published at this point, Um, some of them as short as uh, a single sentence. I also write very long things, and I am an epic fantasy novelist. And the Dunzon Dynasty, which is uh, a series that took me 10 years to write, uh, that has uh, definitely more than a million words. I'm actually not sure how many words it has, but it's pretty long. Um, So I know how to write very long, and I know how to write very short, but I don't seem to have written anything in between. So yeah, (laughs) that's me. (laughs) Yet. I do think, yeah, because I think Grace of Kings is probably the shortest in the series. And that one's like. Still chonky. I mean, the version I (laughs) version I have is like 700 pages. I think it depends on which version you have, but they get progressively longer. So I think a million words make sense. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, In fact, the the last book was so long that um, it was originally planned as a trilogy. And uh, I send the manuscript to my editor um, and he just laughed. Uh, he was like, you know, we, we don't actually have the technology to bind a book 
like this in a way that the spine <laughs> would survive. So you you we can't publish this thing as a single book. So I chopped it in half, which is why there's two books um, that you took up the place of the last book of the trilogy and the trilogy has turned into a quartet. Yeah. So that's what happened. That's nice. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Your poor editor right? is probably just like, God damn, we can. <laughs> you know what? I love it. He found a solution. Where's the it middle ground? For everybody. Where's the middle yeah. ground? <laughs> <laughs> well, I always feel like uh, a, a lot of your work is kind of a, a fun, unique blend of science fiction and fantasy. And there's some other subgenres and historical influences on all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so I'm really interested about like what your reading and like nerdy origins are. Like, what were some of the foundational reads or media? Uh, oh of my your god! Childhood? Oh my god! <laughs> I don't I don't know if this is this is such a this is this could be embarrassing. This could get embarrassing very soon. We'll see. <laughs> uh, so um, the very first sci-fi books I ever got to read, I was like I don't know nine or ten, um, were. Um, do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. Nice. When you were nine or the, ten? Okay. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and then the novelization of uh, The Empire Strikes Back. So these were two of the foundational oh, texts there of we go. my SF uh, career. Um, and then later on, uh, I think uh, the books that made the biggest impact on me when I, were, when I was a little bit older, um, Le Guin. Uh, Le Guin's... Uh, uh, the Dispossessed, that was incredibly powerful for me. Uh, and then I got to read uh, Fahrenheit 451 and uh, Brave New World and so on. Uh, but but I have to say, uh, Philip K. Dick probably made the biggest impression on me, being one of the earliest SF writers I've read. That that makes me so happy. I am such a PKD fan. Oh, you he's no idea. I, like I, I don't get to talk about him very often because people never bring him up. It's like usually if they bring up, um, you know, his work, it'll be like an adaptation, you know, yeah. like Blade Runner or Minority Report or even a Scanner Darkly, I think is well, getting a little bit niche in the, in the movie space. But his books, it's like his books are so. Yeah. Weird, I mean, so PK, PKD is kind of interesting because he is somebody who is probably he's probably one of the most. Um, often adapted as of writers. I mean, many, many yeah. of his stories and books have turned into TV shows and, and movies. Um, and I, I do think you're right that the books themselves, on the other hand, are not nearly as popular or read as often. And they are often very different. I mean, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is much better known to people as Blade Runner, but they are very different works. I mean, Blade Runner is in a lot of ways plot-wise similar, but I, I feel like it it takes the whole Miltonic uh, maker, you know, why did you make me theme a lot more. They it pushed that a lot more than Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is uh, in some ways, much much more surreal and just um, uh, uh, wild. I, I mean, I guess yeah. that's the word I would use. It's, it's bizarre it's wild. in a great yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. He has some really bizarre works. Like, um, what is it? I don't know if you've read this, Ken. The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. I have not read that one. Mm, mm, that sounds interesting. It is, it is. It is basically like a hallucinogenic trip of <laughs> okay. someone living a very banal life on a Mars colony. Um, but in very wow. PKD fashion, it's just the surreal aspects of it between like what's reality and what's not are just so blurred and it's, it's strange as hell, but then you get into like weird oh, works absolutely. like, like I... Ubik or, or Valis or something like that. Yeah. Right. I can definitely see that. Wow. Okay. That's something to look up. You got you got one on your list now. <laughs> but, exactly. Um, so, so PKD was uh, was big for you in the beginning, um, and a lot of the works that you that you mentioned are just fantastic. Um, and and what I think a lot of people could view as like very seminal works. Um, and Le Guin, like the Dispossessed, I think deserves more recognition nowadays than uh, than it does probably get. But along the way, what was it that made you want to write fiction? your own stuff um gosh i mean this is one of those questions where you know 
writers are supposed to have a really cool origin story. Uh, I, I don't really <laughs> have one that's that awesome. I mean, I do remember that I used to do the David Copperfield thing where, you know, David Copperfield would actually, he was very nerdy as a little kid. He read a lot of books and he would tell, recount those stories to his schoolmates um that was his way of you know that was his thing as a as a school kid he told he retold stories he had read to other kids uh that was my thing uh i i read stories and then i would tell them to my schoolmates and that was that was my thing um and my grandmother would say that that's how she knew i was going to be a writer but i i'm not sure <laughs> i think that's there's a more then a little bit of wishful thinking and retroactive uh, construction <laughs> here. But um, I, 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 I can say honestly, you know, based on my own memory, uh, there wasn't a single moment when I decided I wanted to be a writer or anything like that. I mean, I do remember that throughout high school and college, I tried my hand at writing fiction. I was interested in making up stories, telling stories. That was always very interesting to me. But I didn't really seriously try to actually write for publication until after college. Uh, that's when I started taking the craft seriously and actually joining writers' groups and critique groups and, and trying to improve on the craft and trying to actually get better at it. Um, and, you know, it took a very long time before I got to the point where I was good enough to be published and even longer before I felt like it was... I was writing stories that I actually enjoyed and felt were good. Um, so it's not it's not like there was a single moment, more like I had this interest and I kept on practicing at it. And I got to the point where I was I felt like I was getting better. Um, and eventually, over a period of 16, 17 years, I got to the point where I could actually do that as my full time job. So, um, you know, it's not a it's not an exciting burst out of the gate and everything was golden story, but it's just a story of very slow, patient improvement in craft. Um, but you know, it's my story. Uh, and, uh, I'm pretty proud of how far I've, I've come. Yeah, absolutely. And your grandma, your grandma sounds proud of you too. So yeah, but it's good she, because honestly, like the 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 snowball effect it's like it takes yeah. a long time you know to to develop these skills and 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 the confidence to to say like this is something that i'm happy with and and enjoying and and also confident to say like this is publishable you know and meanwhile you're studying you're you know working in software engineering and like high tech legal consultation and that kind of stuff how did that all kind of play into it and and did that eventually come into your fiction in a way that that you could say like you were influenced by the experiences you had in those jobs oh for sure for sure i mean um i had a whole career as um a technologist uh i was a software engineer and then later on i ended up uh as a computer scientist in litigation meaning i was an expert witness it was my job to um understand the technology, to read the source code, to write reports, to explain to the court and the jury how the technology worked and how they mapped to the various legal claims. Um, it, it, was, it was a job that taught me a lot about, one, the importance of storytelling, because that's really what a court case is about. It's competing narratives. It's about stories that you're trying to tell about what happened and which stories weren't compelling. Um, and two, it taught me a lot about the history of technology, um, which is something that comes up again and again in my fiction. I'm, I'm deeply interested in um, technology as an, a manifestation of human nature and how the history of technology is also a history of our own evolution and our own progression as a species. Um, it's a, you know, I sometimes say that technology is our epic poem. It's, it's, it's our expression of who we are. Um, and those ideas, the importance of storytelling and technology as an aspect of human nature are both very core to my fiction, I would say. So they, they come out that way. Um, and as far as, you know, my, my legal career, um, so between uh, being a computer 
uh, engineer and being a litigation consultant, I practiced corporate law for a number of years. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, it turns out that a lot of the technologies that matter to us are not just hardware. When we say technology, right, people often think about hardware, you know, rocket engines and computer chips. But a lot of the technology is software in the sense of legal institutions, legal rules, structures, the corporation. Um, these are also technology and, and they form a part of um, our, um, our, uh, our environment. And being a being a lawyer, actually, and practicing, I could see firsthand how these things, these intangible things, end up being just as important as physical objects in our lives. And they are, um, they shape, you know, who we are and and how we uh, imagine the world and how we tell stories about the universe as much as any piece of hardware. Um, so again, that idea of the software side of technology the 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 social technology the decision the technologies of collective decision making they're also a big part of my fiction so um i would say you know i i mean obviously everybody writes from their own consciousness and from their own uh subjectivity uh and in my case it's ob absolutely true I, I have to all of these experiences i had and the ways i engage with the universe uh end up informing uh, the way I make up stories and, and tell stories. Yeah. yeah. And you, allu you alluded there to something that we're going to dive deep into in our, in our masterclass, which is technology yeah. as story, technology as our epic poem and, and tech fi techno technological fiction and that kind of thing. But right. yeah, I love, I love that, that your career was able to, to kind of infuse into your work. So, so seamlessly in that sense and, and give you, such a strong foundation for you to discuss something that is quintessential to your perspective of the human experience as right. well. Really and cool. society in general right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, very important topic. So you could totally see, um, obviously those themes throughout. Um, yeah. but you, you'd mentioned something earlier, uh, about that you write very, very long things and very, very short things. <laughs> Um, which I think is so fun. <laughs> it's just the dichotomy the there. <laughs> uh, yeah, no middle ground. We don't we don't do things halfway here, okay? Um, no. <laughs> but you you know it, it is striking the the difference in the length of of your published works. So I'm kind of curious to to talk about that a little bit. Um, how was it to start out publishing? You know, the shorter fiction, and how was it to transition? Uh, you know, into kind of more long form? Was that easy? Do you approach them completely differently? Like, just dive into it all for us. <laughs> I think it's, uh, oh, man, this is a very rich and interesting topic. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when I started out, I, I really didn't understand the difference between uh, a short story versus a novel. I, I really didn't. I mean, you know, I read them forever. But Somehow, when you're just appreciating the art, you sort of think of them as different length versions of the same thing. Like a novel is just a very long story, and a short story is just a very short one. But they're really not. Um, it turns out that, you know, the the way they're different, the analogy I use is that... Um, you know, you can imagine there are mosquitoes and there are elephants, but... An elephant is not just a very scaled up version of a mosquito. I mean, they have entirely different body plans and they they function on very different principles. If you took a mosquito and they actually scaled up to the size of an elephant, it would just die because that body structure just won't work. And you can't breathe, I mean, for one thing, and it's it's not gonna work. Um and in practice, what it means is that the way a novel keeps the reader's interest and the, no and, and the way a short story can keep the reader's interest are very different. Um, you can, in fact, in a short story, um, get away with not having plot. I've written tons of short stories with virtually no plot whatsoever. Um, in, in fact, uh, this is something that you don't even notice until you do it. Um, plot really is not critical to a lot of short stories. There are some short stories that are very plot driven, but a lot of them don't 
need it. Um, a, a well-drawn character vignette is sufficient, or perhaps just a very interesting idea is sufficient. Sure, a story can survive without much air, if you will. Um, they're like mosquitoes. They can they can do a lot of things that are very nimble and experimental. Um, but when you're trying to write a novel, plot is incredibly important. And plot is one of those things that I think a lot of writing instruction neglects. Um, for whatever reason, even though we... Um, when we summarize a, a work of fiction, we often just focus on the plot, which is actually, by the way, a terrible way to summarize any work. The plot is often not the best way to describe a, a work at all. But we tend to gravitate towards it. Despite the centrality of plot in the way we talk about books, very little writing instruction is actually focused on plotting. Um, I, you know, I teach in, in an MFA program, and, and I've noticed that plot is just not something that we discuss a lot. A lot of times writers are just supposed to learn this on their own by instinct. Uh, or, uh, I mean, there is an exception. If you're, if you're learning how to write screenplays, there's a huge amount of focus on plot. Almost all focus is on plot and structure to the exclusion, I think, uh, and detriment of, of lots of other aspects that are important. But to pull back to the moment here, that was probably my biggest challenge when I learned, when I was trying to move from writing short fiction to writing a novel, my biggest problem was that I did not know how to plot at all. Um, this is exacerbated by the fact that um, I'm not what you would call a, a plan planner or an outliner. That, that's not my style. I, I, I'm a pantser. I sort of write. I, for short fiction, the way it works is I have the shape of the story in my head, the, the shape of the entire story in my head. And then I just sort of play around with the words until I get that shape down. Um, you can't do that with a novel because often novels are way too big, especially, you know, epic fantasy. They're just too big. <laughs> you can't actually keep the whole thing in your head. So I end up um, not really, it, it was very confusing to me to sort of, uh, sit there and say, I don't actually know what to do here because the story is not moving. It's not exciting. I'm not excited by it anymore. And I don't know why that's never happened to me when I'm writing short fiction. So I basically had to teach myself how to plot. I had to teach myself all the structure and teach myself all the things that are needed for someone to keep on reading. Um, and for me to actually feel like, this is a thing that I can grasp, a thing that I can understand, a, a, to see the emergent structure in the fog of the unknown um, and, and to be comfortable with it. Um, so that was probably my biggest challenge, I would say, to understand how to draft something very long and to understand the structure of a novel and how to perceive that structure and to um, be able to navigate towards it, even though I cannot hold the shape of the whole thing in my head at once. Uh, that was a challenge, um, and then it took me a long time to learn how to do it. Uh, but once I did learn how to do it, uh, it gave an entirely different kind of pleasure from writing short fiction. I really love it. I can't say that I enjoy writing one or the other more, uh, because they're both so interesting and fun, um, mm -hmm. but entirely different, very different things. Yeah, it just flexes like different you, muscles, I feel like. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like you said, it's like you get a different um, sort of pleasure from it. It's like there's sort of a more long-term satisfaction that you get from from writing a novel. And when mm -hmm. you hit those moments, you're like, holy shit. Like you're saying, there's sort of like the fog that's there and it starts yeah. to clear. And when that clarity comes, it's just like, oh, wow, this is incredible. Yeah. Like, oh, but also I can do this. <laughs> yeah. When you're when you're talking about the short stories and the fact that they don't always necessarily need plot, the first thing that came into mind you mentioned the Gwyn earlier, but uh, the story, the ones who walk away from Omalas, that story is so powerful, but nothing really happens. Right, right. But the the potency of it is incredible, and so I love that you made that distinction. It's like you can't necessarily sustain a novel with that that kind of punch and that, that, that immense potency, but store, like when it comes to storytelling, a novel gives you, you know, smaller dopamine hits 
over a longer period of time. Whereas I think short stories give you like a really punchy, like powerful hit yeah. all at once. So it's cool well, that like you the, kind this, of talk about like the shape of the stories and they, you kind they, of fitting the words into They really it. are very different art forms. You know, it's sort of like comparing photography versus cinema. They, they really are very mm. different things um, and they're appreciated. There are elements of the two you know, they share, I mean, in the same way that if you are a filmmaker versus a photographer, there are some commonality to the things you pay attention to and the techniques you would use. But fundamentally, the two mediums are very different and, and you are focused on different things. And I think that's true of short fiction in general, too, um, versus novels. Uh, when I'm writing a short story of 2000 words, what I'm thinking about and what I'm trying to do these are very different things from what I'm trying to do when I'm writing a, a long epic fantasy of 500,000 words. It's, it's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And as you, as you kind of progress with the dandelion dynasty, you know, for me, like, I love, I love the story. It's like the characters, I feel like you like absolutely nail characters and like the way oh, that they sure. like it, the way that they age and the way that you kind of see their progression. And it's just like, you see them and as their dynamics bucks. change yeah, between like, each yeah, other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So good. Yeah. And then you see them get old and 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 their <laughs> personalities change. And it's really cool to kind of witness that in, on, on the page. But um, one thing I love is the way that you kind of blend just uh, that epic fantasy world that you created with things like the ethics of power on both large and intimate scales. So how did you kind of approach the world building in this series? And then how did that kind of power dynamic fit into that framework and and the characters that you inhabited this world with oh my god uh that's a great question and uh uh so i have to digress a little bit to sort of go into yeah, yeah, uh, sure. all this stuff so um the Dandelion Dynasty, uh, I describe the books as silk punk, and that's probably the most distinctive part of the world building. It's, it's a silk punk world. What does that mean? Well, um, so the reason they, <clears throat> I mean, here's how the world actually came about. Um, I was, uh, you know, because, um, as a, as a writer of short fiction, um, I got my collection out early and I got a chance to travel around the world, basically uh, meeting writers and readers from very different cultures around the world as I was trying to promote the book. Um, and it was really fun to talk to them. And, and as we talked about technology and science fiction and our worries about the shared fate of the planet, um, a theme emerged, which was very interesting to me, was that a lot of people said modernity felt to them like a translated experience. So this is true in, um, you know, large parts of Asia, uh, in, in South Africa, in Latin America. What people meant was, you know, um, you know, I may speak uh, an indigenous language at home, but when it comes to all the aspects of modernity, like science or, or economics uh, or politics, meant most of the words you know, I would be educated in English or Spanish or some other language that is not indigenous, you know, to, to, to my people. And I would end up learning to think about those things only in those languages. And even if I were using the indigenous language to talk about them, the words are obviously just transliterations or direct translations from English, German, Spanish, whatever. So there's a sense in which the indigenous language is about the past but modernity is all about in this other language that has to be translated in some sense. And I thought that was really interesting. I mean, I, I obviously understood that this is largely the consequence of colonialism. In a lot of uh, parts of the world, the definition of what modernity is, is the encounter with the European expansion, right? So in Japan, for example, um, the arrival of Commodore Perry's white fleet is the moment of modernity because that's the moment yeah. Japan went from pre-modern to modernity. In China, it will be something like the Opium War. Um, oh, and like in, the conquistadors in, in South America. That's right. That's right. So there will be a pre-modern moment. Do you mind if I interject for, for a second, Ken? Because like, you brought this up and, and I've, I live in Ecuador, so I, I've been able to experience that firsthand. And, and like learning Spanish, I realized that there's kind of uh, multiple layers to what you're talking about in terms of this translated uh, modernity and this translated experience. It's like there's the indigenous people, the Quichua, 
And then there's the fact that they're often forced to speak Spanish because that is that is like the common language in the country, even though it's not their native language. And they are the true native peoples of this of this land. And then on top of that, the people who do speak Spanish, especially the the more um, current generations, they also speak English and they watch uh, they watch Western films. They watch Western TV shows. They throw in English words into right. the mix of their Spanish. And so it's this really crazy experience where there's like multiple languages and multiple layers going on all at the same time. Right. It, it, it's true. And so, um, you know, so I was like, oh, that's really interesting. You know, I'm thinking about this whole translatedness of modernity, what, what that meant. And then I sort of examined um, our own modernity here in the West. And I sort of realized that actually, um, maybe the translatedness goes all the way down. It's It's not just one layer, like you say, but it's multiple layers. Because if you think about it, right, um, I was very struck by this observation that uh, Jack London made. So Jack London, uh, for for listeners and viewers who don't know, um, spouted many very racist views, especially about uh, people from Asia. He, he had very strong anti-Chinese racist views. So one of the things he said in some of his stories was, you know, the Anglo-Saxon mind is, you know, geared towards the language of modernity, um, but the the Chinese mind is incapable of understanding anything other than its own hieroglyphics. So it had this sort of idea that language was connected with modernity. But I found the observation very ironic because the the words we use in English to talk about modernity, so chemistry, physics, democracy, economics, yeah. none of these are Anglo-Saxon <laughs> words. Where Not a single one. Uh, these, <laughs> these are Greek and Latin words that we've been ported. Um, so I find that very comical because it turns out that modernity for us um, – those speakers of Spanish, French, German, and English is also a translated experience because so many of the words we use to construct modernity are repurposed pieces of a Greco-Roman past, which is deeply fascinating, right? So America provides a particularly interesting case study because we are, in, in many ways, perceived by a lot of people as the the quintessential modern nation. It's a very young country in a lot of ways, and it's it's geared towards modernity. It's 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 about being modern, and um, and yet America insists on cosplaying as Rome. I mean, you go to D.C. and you see all of these federal buildings shaped like Roman temples. You you hear that we have a Senate with senators. Um, our our you know constitution was was written and defended by people who took on Roman names as they wrote the Federalist Papers. It's really quite bizarre and strange and, and very wonderful at the same time. But the whole idea of modernity being kind of a reappropriation of the classical past and reconstructing the future struck me as deeply interesting. So if our modernity is a kind of Greco-Roman punk, what other kinds of punkish modernities can we construct if we use other cultural traditions? So silk punk is sort of my attempt to say, what if we could reimagine an alternative evolution of the modernity we have, not based on the Renaissance that took the Greco-Roman past and repurposed it into the future? Um, what if we could take other pasts, say an, an East Asian-inspired kind of classical past and went through a kind of renaissance reconstruction of it can we take those pieces of philosophy of technology of um uh power politics of the software of society and take all of those and recombine them into a modernity that we can compare and contrast with the modernity we are living through and sort of see uh, what insights we can gain. So, you know, this seemed like a really interesting project to me because I was a, you know, I am, uh, I'm, I, I love Anglo-Saxon literature and I love the classical epics, uh, but I also have a lot of love for East Asian traditions and East Asian epics and 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 uh historical romances and i wanted to see if there's a way to build a um 
a kind of reconstituted modernity out of all of these pieces. Can we make this translatedness of modernity felt by everyone um, and, and, and sort of create this new kind of um, interesting thing that I hadn't seen other people do? Um, so that's what this is about. So anyway, so a very long way of going back to explain what Silk Punk is and why I wrote it. So this is a world in which, right, the technology vocabulary has a lot of inspiration from uh, classical East Asian designs uh, in terms of the imitation of animals, in terms of the philosophy of engineering that uh, emphasizes being in harmony with the land and taking advantage of local resources. Um, it also has a very... Um, uh, uh, a technology vocabulary based on things like paper and silk and bamboo and feathers and so on and so forth. And I sort of take these pieces and imagine how you might do things like invent electricity or an electrical based set of technologies around these materials. If, you know, electricity could be discovered, for example, instead of being called electricity, which is based on the Greek word for amber, because amber was one of the first materials to generate static electricity. What if silk were used to generate electricity? And then people might imagine and call it a silk modic force, because, you know, they imagine that the the, the force comes from little moats coming out of the silk, so silkmotic force. So in the, in these books, the silkmotic force is you know what we would now know as electricity. But because it comes out of silk, what are the kind of machines you would build around this 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 origin? What are the sort of inventions you could craft? Anyway, it became incredibly interesting to me, you know, as a technologist to think of this alternative technology future and to sort of imagine, again, similarly, um, we have the modern theory of, of democratic control, of constitutionalism, comes from our particular tradition through the Renaissance up to the present. What if we could imagine an alternative emergence for what we would think of as constitutionalism based on East Asian historical traditions and analogs. What would that look like? So one of the things that the Grace of Kings and all the other books are particularly concerned with is the idea of constitutionalism, but a constitution reconstituted and redrawn out of East Asian analogs. How do you control a centralized power? How do you give voice to individuals um, who are oppressed? How do you aggregate preferences from different parts of society? How do you exercise democratic control over um, central power um, in, within a context that is not the same evolutionary history as you know our political institutions, but a different imaginary set of technologies in politics? Anyway, very long-winded yeah. answer to your question, but that was but the idea. I love it. I love no, it. No, it's great. But the thing is, is, like the ways in which your your explorations of constitutionalism and the explorations of technology, how those things intersect, and how they very often conflict with one another when people get thrown into the mix. Because it's like, I love I love the the ways in which we can view history through the lens of okay, these are the you know, these are the events that took place. These are the forces that built the foundations of a country or what have you. Um, but when things go awry is when people get thrown into the mix and, and something as conceptually sound as constitutionalism or conceptually sound as what, I, I mean, there are so many things that, that sound conceptually good, but then once it Get actually murky. comes into tangible tangible form, once people start playing around with it, once it becomes effective, I love um, the ways in which you played with uh, technology and how uh, your form of electricity kind of took shape with um, sort of like weapons of war, uh, with uh, mobility and transportation and all of these things that over the course of the series drastically changed the landscape of how people are able to interact with one another, but also the ways in which they're able to try and dominate one another. So just bravo, sir, in terms of uh, Thank you. 
Uh, like it sounds like you had fun writing it. Like I love oh. how passionate you are about it, and I had fun reading it. And I'm yeah, I was gonna say that it translates there, through. It comes through. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm, I, I really appreciate that because I did have a huge amount of fun writing it. Uh, and I, I honestly, you know, when I was writing those books, I was like, I have the best job in the world. I mean, how can you? <laughs> Um, how can you have a job in which you're making up things and you're just playing with imaginary things and you're living in this other world? Um, mm. and, and somehow, um, in the end, people are actually going to pay you for this. It's, uh, I, I don't really <laughs> understand how that's even possible. <laughs> you know? If you told me as a case, kid that that's a job, that would be, I would not have believed it. <laughs> yeah. Be like, but also fake. in your case, in your case, there is a very good, uh, sort of like investment value versus like what you what you get you know people people pay for a paperback book or a hardcover but they get a long paperback book or a hardcover right. so they get that's true that's true a lot yeah. of bang for their buck <laughs> Exactly. exactly. I think uh, I think funny. that uh we kind of touched on something a little bit but I want to dive a little deeper into it because uh you know with the intersection of the technology and with what adrian was saying about it gets messy and a little complicated and a little sometimes a little sketchy right once you put people into the mix and like reality strikes um i think that that kind of brings in a conversation about ethics and ethics of power and technology and different dynamics in general and i think a lot of your work tackles some pretty dang complex ethical dilemmas um and i i just want to talk about you know the ways in which you approach those uh, in the kind of really thoughtful way that you do and how you use fiction as this like really compelling vehicle to explore these themes. Um, can you speak to that a bit? Yeah. Um, thank you, first of all. But um, I, I think fiction is very well suited to nuance and to exploration rather than uh, judgment of very complex issues. Uh, what I mean by that is this. I, I think so. Um, I think a lot of times when fiction writers are writing about something, there's a there's a different rhetorical mode fiction writers are engaged in versus what an essayist would be doing, right? So, you know, I was I was trained as a lawyer, so I, I know the difference very well. But when you're writing a a, a legal brief or when you're writing a, a piece of persuasive writing. The entire point is to narrow the field of interpretation as much as possible because you really want to lead the reader down a very narrow path and get the reader to exactly where you want them to go. When you're writing a legal brief, for example, you're supposed to create the illusion that the set of arguments you're weaving literally represents the only bridge over the abyss of irrationality. And if the judge does not follow you exactly where you're telling them to go, then the judge has abandoned all reason, that there's only one reasonable place you can go. But that kind of writing is anathema to fiction writing. Fiction just does not work like that. The entire point of fiction, I like to say, is to open up possibilities. And I would even go so far as to say, I mean, this is a little bit Oscar Wilde, but what the heck. I would say that <laughs> the point of art is to misunderstand the artist. Um, and, and, and by that, what I mean is this. Um, I think when we're in college, no, sorry, not college, when we're in high school or middle school, right? A lot of times we are taught literature in a very bad way, which is the teacher sort of presents a work of literature. I'm talking about very bad teachers. I mean, good teachers don't do this, but bad teacher would say the point of literature is to discern the message, right? It's it's like works of art, literary works are really secret codes. And you are supposed to figure out what the actual <laughs> secret message that the author meant was. So for example, right, if you're reading Moby Dick, the whale is actually not the whale, the whale is actually the devil. And an Ahab is not actually Ahab, Ahab is a failed Christ figure. And you're supposed to read everything in this allegorical manner until you figure out what the message is. And I think it makes a lot of people really hate literary analysis. They think that this is very silly. This is all about, if, if that's what the author meant to say, why didn't the author just come out and say it? 
And the answer is, of course, that is not the point of the author. The author never had a message. That's not the point. If, if, if I had a message like that, I wouldn't bother writing a story. I would just write the message. Like, why go through the trouble of disguising it? It's, it's very silly. <laughs> because the because reason, if, you, if you put it out there too forcefully, then it just becomes preachy and annoying. And people are more <laughs> likely to be averse to the message oh, that God. you're trying to send. You oh, know? God. It's like, we're oh, all God. propagandists. Right, we're all propagandists, yeah, exactly. actually. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, not, not, to, not to name names, but you could, like, throw Ayn Rand into that. Into that oh, mix, I know. I know? was going to say, there's one author who's very much like that. <laughs> um, but I would say for most of us, when we're writing fiction, the reason we write fiction is because we, we don't have a message. We, we are, you know, Le Guin used to say that artists who work with words craft these things because we're trying to say with words what cannot be said in words. I think that's really powerful, and I think it re it's really true. The reason we are writing fiction is because we don't know any other way to say what we want to say. This is the closest we can get to it. We're trying to say with words what cannot be said in words. Um, the reason we use symbolism is not because we have a secret code, but because the symbols are ambivalent. They are equivocal. They are scary. They somehow allow us to express a thing that cannot be expressed. So, you know, let's, let's take the example of... Um, Frankenstein, which is a seminal work of science fiction and, and a really good example for what I'm trying to illustrate here. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, right? And, and she came out of this romantic tradition. She came out of this very, very powerful uh, tradition of imagining the sublime, of engaging with nature, of, of, of writing at this moment when technology is, is, is transforming life as we know it in a way that had not been true before. And she crafted Frankenstein's monster. And she doesn't have an explicit message per se, but the monster became a potent symbol, a kind of modern mythology that has never allowed us to be free of it, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, Frankenstein itself as a novel is not a great piece of science fictional speculation. We don't, in fact, just put pieces of cadavers together and run electricity through them and make them come <laughs> alive. That's not what we do. But the monster, though, as a symbol, is so potent. We cite Frankenstein's monster every single time we talk about new technology. We talk about it all the time. I mean, um, Le Guin says, you know, it's, it's, it's never going to let us go. Every time we look uh, away from a corner of the room, the monster's there because it's it's the quintessential mythology of modernity. Um, that's what artists do. Artists excavate from the collective unconscious these powerful, potent symbols that somehow express an idea that was not expressible before. Before Mary Shelley, Frankenstein's monster did not exist, and we had no mythology to express this fear, this relationship to technology. And afterwards, we could not do it any other way than through that myth. So in some ways, Frankenstein's monster is just as powerful as Apollo and Dionysus and all the other gods because they also allow us to speak about aspects of the psyche, about reality, about the universe that have no other name. The symbols are potent because they allow us to say what could not be said before. Um, so anyway... Another long-winded answer, but the point Some, is, I want to throw some. I want to throw something in there real quick. I yeah. love the the fact that you brought up Frankenstein. I recently discussed it on a podcast with some friends uh, over at Fiction Fans. Um, something that fascinates me about Frankenstein is the potency of the symbol and the potency of the 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 myth, but the mutability of it. The fact that it can mutate to the individual, it can mutate to the society, it can mutate in terms of its allegorical value to an individual on the micro scale, but also to a society on the macro scale, which is absolutely you are a hundred percent right. So, that, so fascinating. That's what makes it into a myth, right? Because it is this this it's 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 this pattern that is potent. It's not it's not a simple one-to-one -one mapping of anything. It's this potent thing that changes shape and meaning depending on how you look at it. I mean, I can make an argument for how Frankenstein's monster is, is a perfect symbol for um, our particular uh, concern and fear of AI, right? Because AI is constructed from cadavers put together <laughs> in a way that Frankenstein's monster is. And it also has the same kind of thing. We constantly are acting and, and questioning 
is this thing, does this thing have a soul? Is this thing real? Is this thing nothing more than dead words being recycled? Or is it we're something? Also, we're also questioning its motives and its learning capacity in the same yes. way that Frankenstein yeah. was, was yes. you know, contending with the fact that his creation was learning Absolutely. language. It was learning all these different things. And it's just like, oh yep. my God. Yeah. Like, oh no. I know. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. Such a potent symbol. And and so, you know, to go back to your original question, MJ, that's, that's what I think fiction is about. It's not so much about trying to express a message, really. In fact, I, I think, you know, the reason why people disagree so vehemently about the interpretation of a piece of fiction is because fiction is open-ended. It, it is, um, it's a simple, I mean, the, the mutability of Frankenstein's monster is in some ways the mutability of all fiction. Um, it's, it's, it is the, the reading experience, the reading you come away from a piece of text depends on what you put into it. And that mm-hmm. changes with every reader. Yes. Well, yeah, I've always, like I've every, said every... that. Go ahead, MJ. I was just say I've said that before that that's like a beautiful thing, but a scary thing about putting fiction out there, right? As the writer, because once you release it to a reader, it's no longer wholly yours. The mm, reader yes. is bringing their unique set of experiences and mindsets their to the story, just and their, just like yeah. you brought your set of unique experiences and mindsets to writing it. And the reading experience is those two things coming together, which is beautiful. But as mm-hmm. a writer, you know, it can be scary because people can draw things from your book that you never intended. But exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at yeah. that point, that's not the point of it. it. It's it's core to the artistic experience, really. I mean, it's it's sort of amazing, really, to what extent the art, any piece of art that we approach, is not just the thing itself or or the author's conception of it, but this this whole set of of discourses and other art conversations and everything about who you are and who you've been in that moment. I mean, Susan Sontag used to have this thing and saying that, you know, every photograph is a lie. Um, and, and she meant it in a very deep way, not in a trivial way, not, not in the sense that photographs, you know, leave out things and are framed as certain things, what, what, whatever. Her point was, you cannot understand a photograph until you've understood every moment leading up to that photograph. Because the totality of that set of experiences behind it gives that photograph meaning, and you cannot discern that meaning from that moment alone. But at the same time, her point, I think, can be extended to point out that you cannot really understand a photograph until you remember every moment that led you up to that point of doing the interpretation. So it's, it's, it's both directions. You know, it's kind of amazing. And it's kind of uh, even more messy and 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 blurred in this day and age where we have social media and platforms like Instagram where people are kind of like manufacturing their photographic intent and the message that they want to send out there but also it's like the value of of a photo has kind of been you know downplayed in our society where there are so many because they're digitized and because they're on social media platforms that we undervalue the fact that it's like People used to spend a ton of money to go get a family <laughs> portrait that was in black and white, you know, and the pho- photographer put their head under a blanket and it flashed a super bright light. And that was like a momentous occasion. Mm-hmm. Now and I now, took seven photos of my cat with my phone today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and even more than that, the <laughs> photos you, you took have been reshaped by machine learning algorithms. Like the thing that yeah. you see ultimately has been enhanced and changed in so many ways um, that it's it's hard to even call that um, the same kind of photograph as the early the grill types. You know, it's, it's a different yeah. thing now. Yeah, anyway. It's like, yeah. what is reality, man? Going yeah. back to PKD. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a fucking illusion. <laughs> I feel like this conversation has only gotten me more excited oh about our masterclass that we are going to be having uh, next week for the listeners here. Um, but before we get into into talking about all that cool stuff with you, to kind of wind down, I want to know what the future holds for you, Ken. What uh, Can you tell us about what you're working on next or what's uh, next in the pipeline for you? Okay, so I'm actually uh, suffering from a bit of a letdown right now because recently I was hired to work on an amazing, cool uh, film project where I was nice. asked to reboot a, a pretty popular uh, series of films um, as a TV show. So I, I did 
the work of, you know, writing up what the TV show would be like. And I was super excited about it and it was amazing. And, you know, the people who hired me to do it were very excited. But for various reasons, um, you know, this is just very common in the industry, uh, mm-hmm. the project was was then canceled. So Ugh. I had all these amazing <laughs> ideas that I was going to move forward and I did all this work and now it's not going to go anywhere. And that that's really kind of, you know, depressing. Uh, it's but deflating. That's, Ugh. Yeah, it is. But it's the reality of working in... TV it's the reality of what happens when we, yeah. you know, when we uh, fund art uh, by by the market. You know, the market giveth and the market taketh away. So uh, I, I would never had had this opportunity if if, if we weren't in the market. Um, but you know, by the same token, it's taken away. So I'm a little sad about that. Um, but so this is just for those listeners who are aspiring to work in the industry, you know, this is something you're going to have to prepare for. You may work really, really hard on something you love, uh, but sometimes you're not going to be um, in charge of bringing it. You, you don't get to decide if, if it's going to happen or not. It's just the way it is. So anyway, so that aside, um, I am working on a couple of short stories um, and um, I'm also uh, drafting up. uh, So, I do a fair amount of public speaking um, and, 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 and things like that. And I'm drafting up a couple of new speeches where I'm trying to explore the whole relationship between um, creativity, human creativity and AI. Uh, this is a fairly important topic for a lot of us right now uh, in this moment where, you know, creative individuals feel threatened by the rise of AI and, I've done a lot of thinking on this sort of thing, and I've crafted some presentations to sort of uh, explore the idea of what does it really mean uh, to have AI uh, exhibit or imitate works of art? Um, what does it even mean, really, to 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 work with AI as an artist? Can you really do it? Um, and by observing what AI does, do we? And can we gain a more um, nuanced understanding of what it is we ourselves do as artists and and, and push our own art in different directions? Anyway, those are very interesting questions to me. So I'm working oh, on I love yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going we're gonna to touch on that, on that in the I was going to say, too, I also makes me excited for the you, master class. Yeah. <laughs> foreshadowing. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, I'm very excited. And yeah, I, I totally get it about the, about the, the TV show stuff. Cause like, uh, Hugh Howie mentioned to me once, it's like, he really lucked out in the sense that this year he had silo yeah. release, uh, and it was really good. And then I think beacon 23 is coming out or has already started coming out. Um, which is based on another one of his works, but he was like, if, I don't like, I don't believe that it's a reality that it's happening until I turn on my TV and it's there, like on yeah. the streaming platform. Well, because in, so in showbiz, stuff gets cut even after it's been yeah. filmed. And like, it's yeah. there's so much outside of your control. So, yeah. so much. Yeah. I mean, that's what happened to, to Pantheon, uh, the, the animated show that's based on my short stories. I mean, mm-hmm. two seasons were made, but you know, it yeah. was canceled before the second season could even come out. You just don't, oh you don't, you yeah. don't know. You don't know, but it, at least at industry. least it made it. At least it made it to the, <laughs> yes. you know, <laughs> yeah. like two seasons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, buddy. Well, to close out, we have a uh, two two requests. If you could give listeners and viewers a a good bit of soundbite writing advice, and b tell us a weird or random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating. Okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'll start with um, um, uh, the writing advice. Uh, I would say that the most useful piece of writing advice I can give to people is do the thing that's most exciting to you. Um, and I say that uh, with all sincerity, because I think a lot of times, because we are artists in a, artists in a um, market economy, um, we sometimes confuse the two. We confuse what sells with what is good. And, and, and in fact, or with what we want to do, um, we are tempted to chase trends. We're tempted to, to censor ourselves based on whether something we want to do is marketable or not. And I, I have to say that this is all kind of pointless. Um, it is much easier 
to do the thing that's exciting to you and then to figure out how to get people to pay you for it versus the alternative, which is to do something you think will get you paid and then try to fall in love with it. Um, it just doesn't work. Um, so do the thing that's exciting to you um, and then let the rest figure itself out. Um, and in, in terms of the random uh, useless fact, uh, this is something I learned very recently, which is um, there's long been a um, cliched or uh, a kind of just a supposed common knowledge that photography led to a crisis in the visual arts and caused a lot of uh, portrait painters to lose their jobs. This is commonly accepted as true. Uh, that is, back in the 19th century, after 1839 or so, when photography became a fairly common uh, thing, that a lot of portrait um, painters lost their jobs or you know, were forced to shift into some other form of visual art. Um, that's really not true. There's there's actually almost no evidence that that happened at all. This is basically one of those cliches that we think is true, but it's true only through a lot of repetition. It's, there's no evidence that that was true at all. Um, artists, in fact, loved photography, um, and not necessarily for reasons you might think. A lot of visual artists loved photography because um, you can now create reproductions of your own work and sell them to raise extra money. Or you can keep a copy of the work after you've given the original to whoever commissioned it. Or you could use photography as a way to generate studies for the works you want to do. So instead of doing sketches, you could generate a study. Um, now, there were some artists who were put out of work by photography, and they absolutely despised photography, and they were the engravers, the printmakers, because engravings and prints were the only ways to make reproductions of art, and they required a lot of human skill. Photographs, on the other hand, basically made that entire profession irrelevant. So it is not true that the painters were threatened by photography, but the engravers, they were. And that is not a commonly known fact. And I find it very fascinating that we that have is really cool. the wrong narrative. Yeah. yeah. You you pinpointed the exact thing where it's like using a photo as a reference or a study. It's like being able – imagine like having to paint someone and just have them sit there for like eight fucking hours and then be like, okay, we're going to come back the next day and try and recapture right. like the position and the lighting. You got to sit blah, blah, exactly blah. the same. Yeah. Horrible. <laughs> Horrible. That's like my worst nightmare. So just being in able fact, to take a picture of something and use that as a reference is amazing. In, in fact, art students today still do the same thing. I mean, artists today yeah. still use photographs for that purpose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Good fact. That's a good fact, Ken. I like it. <laughs> Sorry, engravers. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, Ken, thank you so much for hanging out with MJ and I today. Uh, it was an absolute honor. So we really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. And uh, can you let everyone know where they can find you online? Yes. Um, so uh, I have a website, which is kenliu.name, K-E-N-L-I-U dot N-A-M-E. Um, and you can also go there and sign up for my newsletter, which is on Substack. So it's kenliu.substack.com, or you can just go to my website and there's a link to it. Awesome. And you can go pick up The Grace of Kings and... The three sequels and that you can pick up the paper menagerie and other stories, the hidden girl and other stories and all this great stuff. Um, you can also follow SFF addicts on Instagram, Twitter, threads, blue sky, all that jazz at SFF addicts pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me across all the socials at MJ Kuhn books, or you can find me um, just at MJ Kuhn.com. And speaking of newsletters, you can sign up for MJ's newsletter yeah. and get a free story. Get a free novelette, baby. Yeah. <laughs> get the free stuff, then buy the buy the yeah, non-free the, stuff. Then if you like it, buy the stuff that costs money and yeah. helps me buy my cat treats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Support Thorin's food Support addiction. Thorin's treat habit. <laughs> little chunky boy. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for part two with Ken for a mini masterclass on technology fiction and technology as story. Now keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts. <laughs> <laughs>